All right, welcome everyone. This is Kirsten Tynan, Executive Director of the Fully Informed Jury Association. Happy Jury Rights Day. Uh, today's presentation is entitled Jury Duty is for Heroes. Back in January of 2020, I had the opportunity to give a TEDx talk in little old Hamilton, Montana. But the thing about that is they only let you have 15 minutes. And I didn't get to tell nearly the number of stories that I have of jurors who have heroically uh, stood up for the accused in a case for a number of reasons, many times because the law was wrong and sometimes because even though the law was generally right, in a particular case at hand, it was wrong. So I'm gonna tell some of those stories and um, those will be not only historic stories, but also modern stories because not only do I think it's important to show that there's a foundation um, in history and in our legal systems that dates back hundreds of years uh, for what Fiji teaches, which is that you have the right to judge the law as well as the facts in a case. And if you think the law is wrong or the law is wrongly applied in the case at hand, you have the right to vote not guilty, even if you believe it was proved beyond reasonable doubt that someone technically broke that law. So not only is there a foundation for that in hundreds of years of history, but that is also something that is not uh, obsolete. It's something that's still in use today. And I am excited to talk to you about some of those trials. Let's start though with the first one. And that is, in fact, this wasn't actually the first one, but it's the first one for us today because we are commemorating this case. And that is the trial of William Penn and William Meade. And this is an interesting case because it was clearly a setup by government. If you go to the Fiji Facebook, or sorry, the Fiji website to our Jury Rights Day page, and I will endeavor to post a link to that um, here shortly, um, you will find a link to the transcript of that trial. And by transcript, I think what I mean is, it, it, my research indicates that later, sometime after this trial, William Penn and William Meade went and wrote up their recollections of how the trial went, but their recollections seem extremely specific, like it's a, an exchange of specific dialogue. So <laughs> there is a possibility they may have embellished a bit. It's possible that they... Um, were a little more um, eloquent in their verbiage than in real life, but it's what we have. It's the best account we have of that um, trial. So uh, what happened in that trial? Well, as it turns out, William Penn was a Quaker in England at a time when Quakers were heavily looked down on, um, discriminated against. Uh, they were not the approved religion of the state. And laws were in fact passed to prevent them from engaging in their worship as they saw fit. And also uh, presumably to prevent them from uh, enticing other people to join them. In the case of William Penn, he actually had a meeting house, but the government decided they would go and lock it up, knowing full well that this would not prevent him from preaching as he felt called to do. And indeed, Penn did preach that day with his meeting house locked up. He instead chose to preach in Grace Church Street in public. Now, this probably violated England's Conventicles Act. Uh, there were more than one. It looks like one was um, updated uh, in kind of in anticipation of more uh, anti-Quaker actions. Um, but it looks like he violated that law. What's interesting in the trial transcript, though, is that Penn asks, well, what law did I violate? And the judge doesn't cite that law. The judge, and, and by the judge, I mean the, the judge who did most of the talking. There were actually multiple judges in this trial, and I don't have a good handle on why that was. But the judge, who was essentially leading the, the bench, said, oh, you violated the common law. And he wouldn't cite a specific law. And I don't know what the reason for that would be. Nonetheless, it's likely that Penn did violate this Conventicles Act um, based on um, the, the language that uh, I've read. Uh, and therefore, he, he, he basically was uh, saying to his jurors, look, 
um, A, they can't even tell me what lie violated, but B, you, you should follow your conscience in any case. And he made quite a, quite a lot of noise about that during his trial to the point where uh, not only were judges screaming at him, but he was actually thrown in, I believe it's called the bail dock, um, which is basically to remove him from the presence of the jurors. And it, he has this, there's this great moment in this trial where as he's being dragged away, he's, he's exhorting the jurors, you know, vehemently, mind your privilege, give not away your right. And that is something that has stuck with me to this day. Um, indeed, those jurors did mind their privilege. What happened to them? Well, they were at one point sent off to deliberate. And when they came back, they the judge wanted to know their verdict. Well, he's guilty of speaking in Grace Church Street. That was all they would say. And the judge said, that's not enough. Uh, he was being tried for conspiracy and for a uh, violent tumult, <laughs> essentially a riot, uh, that he was conspiring with William Meade, his co-defendant, to uh, cause this disturbance in the street. And the juror simply would not convict him of that and it, what ended up happening, I believe it was about four days that they ended up being at three or four days, they were imprisoned. And in that time, not only did they have food and water withheld them, but tobacco and fire. They couldn't even smoke in prison. <laughs> and of course, there were no uh, sanitary facilities. So it was just a, a filthy situation that they were stuck in. The goal of the judge, as he explicitly stated, was we will have a verdict from you or you will starve for it. He wanted them to hurt until they changed their vote. So what did they do? Well, it looks like about four of the jurors, and it's hard to tell exactly from the record, but about four of the jurors were like, we're not changing our verdict. Uh, when they came back, Finally, the court accepted a not guilty verdict from them. They, they wouldn't even continue with the guilty of speaking verdict. They said just not guilty at that point. And so the verdict was accepted and the jurors were once again thrown in prison because the judge levied a fine on them. He was going to penalize them for voting their conscience with a fine and they were to stay in jail until they paid it. Well, what ended up happening is they, that led by jury foreman Edward Bushel or Bushell. I, I've seen it with one L and two Ls, and I've never really been sure of the pr pronunciation. So choose your, choose your pronunciation, I guess. He appealed that uh, punishment to a higher court. And that higher court led by a justice named John Vaughn ended up ruling that jurors could not, essentially jurors could not be punished for their verdict. Um, and that is a key piece of our legal system still today that essentially empowers jurors with their right of jury nullification. Not only can you not be punished for your verdict, but what really gives it teeth is if you deliver a not guilty verdict, it can't be overturned in criminal court. So those two things together, are rights that jurors have, and those rights summed up and essentially total up to jury nullification or conscientious acquittal, some people call it. And so that is the story of William Penn and why we celebrate today, September 5th, in honor of that uh, verdict, accepted September 5th, 1670. If you are lucky enough to be in London at some point, and you travel to the courthouse known as the Old Bailey, there is indeed a plaque hanging up in the Old Bailey to this day, explaining how these hero jurors not only saved William Penn, but also established this right of jury nullification still today. Now, something I'm going to mention about this is, it's not just our jury rights that are um, grounded in this case. But if you look at the First Amendment, the five freedoms listed there, there are at least four of those five that I can trace back to cases of jury nullification. And three of them trace back to this case in particular, freedom of religion, 
freedom of speech and freedom of assembly all find some foundations in this case. And so it is very important to recognize that um, not, not only do we have the constitution uh, in the United States that guarantees these things, but they are also, a lot of these things are also grounded in historical cases such as this one. The, the fourth of those rights that traces back to a case of jury nullification is freedom of the press. And this also has a wonderful story that predates the founding of the United States, though it does take place on North American soil. In fact, in the colony of New York. And I'm gonna just, let's see if we can, hopefully I can show this, oh, not too shabby. I have a book here. I don't know if you're seeing this reversed or not, but it is called Revolutionary Descent, How the Founding Generation Created the Freedom of Speech. Uh, and it's by Stephen D. Solomon. And it's a wonderful book that, that talks about how jurors were involved in these things. And it has a nice account of the trial of a man named John Peter Zenger. John Peter Zenger was a printer in the colony of New York. And at that time, New York had a very corrupt governor. Now the um, competing paper, which was also a private paper, was sort of in, in this governor's pocket. They were good buddies. And that paper would not print anything um, basically holding him to account. Now, most people think, oh, freedom of the press, that is something where the press is supposed to like hold the government's feet to the fire and keep them accountable to the public and whatnot. And indeed that is largely how we view it today, but that is not how it was back in the day. In fact, um, libel was very a very different concept as well. How it used to be, <laughs> is almost completely backwards from how we view it now. In the past, if you said something bad about the government, that was bad for you. But if what you said bad about the government happened to be true, we today would think, well, it's true, you're off the hook. Not so back then. In the past, if you said something bad about the government, that was scandalous. But if it was true, why that was even more scandalous. And the more scandalous, the more guilty you were presumed to be. So that was the situation that John Peter Zinger was looking at when he was arrested for seditious libel, I believe, uh, for printing true things about the government uh, behaving in a corrupt manner. Um, and he had a wonderful trial, the transcript of which is also available online. I need to dig up a good link to it and get that on our website. But in that case, uh, he was represented by, I have to get this right because of the musical, I keep getting confused, Andrew Hamilton, not to be con con uh, confused with Alexander Hamilton. <laughs> His attorney, Andrew Hamilton, um, was, uh, why isn't this one a musical? Come on, this is a brilliant story. I love this one. He was um, arguing with the judge back and forth over the jury's right of jury nullification. And the judge kept saying, oh, you can't do that. You can't do that. Well, why did, why did Andrew Hamilton keep arguing? It's because he was in full view and full earshot of the jury. So he knew very well that they could process exactly what he was saying. And he went on at great length, fully informing them of their rights as jurors not to convict John Peter Zinger. And in fact, those here jurors did just that. They refused to convict him. Mind you, this is not the first set of jurors that refused to harm uh, Zenger. There was actually at least one, I think, if I my vague recollection is there may have been more than one grand jury that the governor called to attempt to indict him. And when that didn't work, that's when he used other means to get him into court. So numerous jurors throughout the process, not just trial jurors, but also grand jurors, did a great job of standing up not only for John Peter Zinger, but also for freedom of the press and also for freely being able to speak true things, even if the government doesn't want you to. So that's 
that covers four out of the five uh, freedoms in the First Amendment that I can specifically trace back to cases of jury nullification. The one I can't, if anyone wants to help me out with, if you find anything on the uh, right to uh, petition the government for redress, <laughs> I have not seen that tied to a case. But if, if anyone is aware of that, please help me add to the collection. I would love to do that. Now, this all happened before the founding of the United States. So one of the things I've studied quite a bit is how did this end up in part of our legal system? Well, it has a lot to do with the American Revolution. And I'm going to tell a couple of these stories. But first, I want to share with you this book, wonderful book called The Trials of Allegiance, Treason, Juries, and the American Revolution by Carlton F. W. Larson. We had a reading group on this. All of you who missed the reading group seriously missed out. It is an amazing book. What this man has done, and I as a uh, person trained in engineering seriously appreciated this, he went through historical records of a particular uh, time period in the midst of the American Revolution when a number of people in Philadelphia were being tried for treason. Well, what had happened in this case? Uh, in this situation, basically, uh, the British came in, uh, par pardon me for our, our, uh, our uh, uh, UK citizen who is in attendance. Hopefully, uh, hopefully uh, I get this right. You keep me honest. Um, but the British came in and uh, took some prisoners and um, basically uh, took over the town and everything and when that kind of shook out, people were accused of aiding them in various ways. And when they supposedly aided them uh, in various ways, they were said to have committed treason. Well, there wasn't a really well-defined court system in the midst of the revolution. There weren't really well-defined rules for what constitutes treason, but what was clear was treason was punishable by death. And so what happened was this man, uh, Professor Larson, went through the records from that time and compiled as much information as he could find on the juries in these treason trials. And essentially, I believe there is, when it, when it all shook out, uh, many of the jurors served on multiple cases. Uh, many of them had religious convictions against uh, the death penalty. Um, a number of them were Quaker, for example. And after a couple of people were convicted of treason, they started thinking, we, I'm not, yeah, I don't feel good about that. This is not going to keep going on. And so there were just a bunch of, of people found not guilty. The people who had been convicted, the jurors then went back and asked for leniency, um, some, some level of pardon from the, the uh, government in that case for, for most of those people. I believe there's only one person who actually was executed. And it looks like kind of what the jurors thought was, well, okay, maybe they helped the other side, but let's think about this. You're, you've got a family, you've got property, you're just trying to scrape out a living and stay alive. There's this politically tumultuous time. You're just trying to get along with whoever you think is going to keep you alive Maybe you don't have, you're not invested in one side or the other, but you just, you're just trying to take care of yourself and your family. And that's what these jurors kind of thought most of these people accused of treason were doing. And maybe they thought, oh, they shouldn't have done what they did to help the other side, but they could understand why they would want to do that just to kind of keep themselves and their family safe. And is that something we really want to kill them for? One thing I hear a lot in liberty circles that disturbs me greatly is, especially you know when we're talking about people in the government who are doing something we don't like, and there are plenty of those, believe me. <laughs> I, I agree on that. <laughs> but I will hear a lot of people, oh, treason, we gotta, we gotta get these people on, on charges of treason. It's like, well, you might wanna think about that a little bit. It, it just, Think about, just stop for a minute and think about if you had to go next door and harm your neighbor to the point of killing them, 
Is that something you really want to do? Is that something you want to take lightly and just toss that word around? I don't think that I would. Um, and I can certainly understand these jurors having lived in the community with these people. Maybe they've done business with them. Maybe they have traded goods with them. Maybe they've helped them or been helped by them in some charitable way. Just then to be asked to say, yes, the government can go ahead and kill these people. That's, that's a big ask. And that's something that hopefully we all take very seriously, as did these jurors in the midst of the American Revolution. So even as these, uh, these people were thrown into a situation where they were trying to assert their rights um, as Englishmen, and I'm going to take a side trip on that in a minute. <laughs> I'm going to write that down real quick because I don't want to forget that. Um, as they were asserting their rights as Englishmen to participate in the English government and absent that were ready to secede, um, here they were trying to uphold kind of the principles by which they were they themselves wanted to be judged. And so I really appreciate that about them in such a, a politically tumultuous time with emotions running high and violence running high, that I really think took a lot of courage. The thing, the little side trip we're going to take really quickly is to mention uh, a little bit about our first Chief Justice of the United States uh, Supreme Court, John Jay. The reason we're going to take this side trip is because coincidentally, this also happened on September the 5th, albeit uh, I think about maybe not quite 100 years later. Um, John Jay actually, with a, a committee of um, other colonists, uh, penned an, a, an open letter to the uh, citizens of Great Britain, I believe it was called. Is that correct at that time? I have to, I have to double check. I'm trying to pull it up here real quick. Uh, and this was pre-revolution. This was sort of uh, laying the foundation for, for the revolution, but um, it was in 1774, so just a little over 100 years after um, the trial of William Penn. Uh, the, a, he penned on behalf of this committee an address to the people of Great Britain. And one of the things that he stated in it was that Quote, we claim all the benefits secured to the subject by the English constitution, and particularly that inestim inestimable one of trial by jury, end quote. So that was in 1774. What he is more famous for in jury nullification circles is the uh, very unusual trial of Georgia versus Brailsford in Georgia versus Brailsford is notable because it is one of, I believe there were only three known trials, uh, jury trials at the United States Supreme Court level. Most people don't know that that is a possible uh, thing that can happen, but there are certain limited circumstances specified in the United States Constitution wherein the Supreme Court can hold a jury trial. And of those three trials, this is the only one of which any substantial records seem to have survived. So thank you uh, on behalf of jury, jury rights educators everywhere for having those records preserved, because this case was particularly notable because of John Jay's instructions to the jury. And in those instructions, he basically told them, jurors, you are generally considered to be the ex experts on the facts of a case. We judges are generally considered to be the experts of the law. So if you want the, we'll tell you what the law is. And if you want to rely on our advice, that's generally what happens. Nonetheless, it is your right to judge for yourselves, both the law and the facts in a case at hand. And so I love this, this uh, address to great, to the people of Great Britain, because now you kind of see where those instructions come from. Why was John Jay giving those instructions? Why was he? Why did he have any any sort of um, of esteem for these jurors? Well, back nineteen years before, he was talking about claiming all of the benefits secured to the subject 
by the English Constitution, including trial by jury. And this is a terrible copy to show you, <laughs> but <laughs> this book is entitled, it's a used copy, I believe it's out of print. It's entitled Verdict According to Conscience, Perspectives on the English Criminal Trial by Jury 1200 to 1800. And what, why did they consider trial by jury inestimable? Well, this book documents some of that. It's, it, and you can actually find the records from some of these trials online in the online records of the Old Bailey. <laughs> and one particular era in English history that he talks about is known as the Bloody Code era. There was a, a situation in which there was a bit of property crime rampant in England's forests in particular. Uh, people would uh, steal, steal wood, I believe, um, animal, poach animals, that sort of thing. And they would do so having uh, covered their face with um, bl a black substance so that they wouldn't be identifiable. And so the, um, I believe it's called the Waltham Black Act. Um, and the black part of it comes from this uh, substance they would cover their face with. They would try to black out their faces so they wouldn't be identifiable so that they, it would be difficult to prosecute them. But because of this situation, uh, the Waltham Black Act, um, and I think maybe another, another law or two all, also, essentially jacked up the penalty for a number of crimes that were ve even very minor ones so that they were all punishable by death. So to, since I have a, a mostly American audience, just to give an example, um, one of the things that uh, was listed was pickpocketing. And so what did jurors in these cases do? Are they gonna execute someone for pickpocketing? Again, we're talking about a human being's life. It's your neighbor, someone maybe you've made friends with, someone who's maybe been kind to you. Maybe they fell on hard times and in an act of desperation stole something that's wrong, but are you going to kill them for it? Well, not a lot of people feel good about that in pretty much any era, and certainly these jurors didn't. So if you look through the records of the Old Bailey, you will find cases in which someone is accused of stealing a certain amount and just the part uh, I'm going to translate a little bit for my American audience is let's say uh, the law says if you steal 20 bucks or more, you are you know, guilty of this felony level death punishable theft. Well, we see records that are comparable to this in the old Bailey where they say, oh, you were found with a $20 bill. We find that to be the value of that to be $19.99. So you're guilty of a misdemeanor and you don't get killed. So that was a form of jury nullification in that they didn't convict them of what was strictly um, uh, the accurate charge so that they didn't have to punish them in a way that they felt was far, far too harsh to even be just. And one thing I like about that is we see analogs to that in modern cases as well, where maybe someone uh, committed a higher level offense uh, by the letter of the law, but jurors actually convict them of a lesser charge because they think, yes, you shouldn't have committed this offense, but there are mitigating circumstances. So we, we feel that higher level punishment is too much. And I'm going to talk about some of those cases as we um, start to transition to uh, a little bit more modern uh, examples of hero jurors. This is still historic, but I, I, it's a lot more recent. And so what we're going to, we're going to take a minute here. I've got my, my uh, 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 prop here with me. And I'm just going to ask really quickly, if you're on Zoom, put it in the chat. If you're on Facebook, maybe in the comments here, let me know how many of you have ever indulged in a cocktail or hard liquor or wine or beer? Anyone? Pretty sure the answer is no one, of course, because uh, we had prohibition in the United States. Perhaps our, our compatriot uh, across, the, across the ocean has, but in the United States, as we all know, there was that prohibition era 
and that stuck and none of us has had a drop of liquor to this day, right? Okay, that's not quite how it worked out, is it? <laughs> well, if you have ever had the opportunity to uh, imbibe in, in this uh, enjoyable way, you can thank a juror for that in the United States. And why is that? Well, I believe it was less than an hour after federal prohibition took effect that the very first liquor violation in the United States was recorded. <laughs> and those violations would continue to be extensive throughout a decade that came to be known as the Roaring Twenties and not for no reason. The, the prohibition rules did basically nothing to stamp out the consumption of alcohol. Um, people made excuses that they were using things for medicinal purposes. People took their uh, activities and production underground. And, you know, in some cases, people actually didn't hide it very much. <laughs> well, I have looked through a number of newspapers looking for prohibition era articles to learn how did jurors deal with these. And I was so encouraged by what I found. And I'll just share one case, um, maybe more than one. We'll, we'll see how, how it goes. Um, but I love this case in particular because I felt the jurors um, were so conscientious. And in this particular case, uh, the article I found wasn't about the trial. Rather, it was about what happened the next day when the judge called these jurors back to court, stood him up in front of him and gave them quite the tongue lashing for what he thought they had done wrong. Let's see if you agree or disagree. These jurors, I thought were very conscientious. Okay, they basically, they, they had been called in to judge a liquor violation. They uh, listen to the trial very carefully, the testimony, the evidence, everything was done, the closing arguments. They're now sent off to the jury room to deliberate. And what is sent with them? Why? The evidence. And when the evidence was sent with them, they did what you and I are probably doing. Well, I'm looking at this. How do I know that's alcohol? This is a clear substance, right? Could be water. You know what? I can't convict him just on that. I'm gonna to have to do a little experiment. And they were very conscientious. They did that indeed. Boy, yep, that, that, that evidence test was good, but it's not enough. Let's let all the other jurors try this out. So one by one, they went around the room doing their very conscientious experiment on this sample. And at one point discovered to their surprise, there was no evidence left. What could they do? If there's no evidence, they certainly had to find him not guilty. And in fact, they acquitted this gentleman of any sort of alcohol violation. And for that, if you can believe it, this judge was scolding them. I mean, they did their level best to try and follow all of the instructions and do what they were supposed to do. And here they were getting chewed out for it. All of them, but one that is. Uh, I'm sure this was a total coincidence, but uh, there was one woman juror who didn't, wasn't able to make it to court that day. She was homesick. Totally unrelated, I am sure. <laughs> Well, that's not the only case from the Prohibition era that I have found. Uh, we actually have an episode uh, in which Robert Anthony Peters, our vice president, and I go through a number of cases uh, on the Fiji podcast behind closed doors. There is a wonderful case in which the jury acquits a man of a liquor violation and in celebration, he pulls a bottle out of a paper bag and takes a swig right there in court and is promptly rearrested. <laughs> there are cases where um, jurors are taken out for a beer after they acquit a, a, someone of a liquor violation and they're taken out by the judge to go get a beer. It's just amazing. There were a, a large number of jurors who simply would not convict their neighbors during the prohibition era. And so there we have an example of another uh, United States constitutional amendment 
that is brought to us in part thanks to jury nullification. And that's the 21st Amendment repealing prohibition. Now, to transition to a little more modern times, what kind of analogs does anyone see there? Um, anyone, anything in particular uh, come up, come to mind? Well, for me, this has a really strong resemblance to the modern uh, prohibition era in which uh, cannabis is prohibited. And we actually have seen a number of cases in which jurors refuse to convict their neighbors uh, for victimless cannabis crimes. Uh, in San Diego, we saw a series of trials in which people who were using it for medicinal purposes, people who were had, had very serious cancer or other you know, similar level illnesses who were medicating for medical purposes. And yet uh, I believe her name is Bonnie Dumanis, the uh, prosecutor at the time in the area was one by one taking them to court. And we gotta give a big shout out to um, uh, Americans for Safe Access San Diego chapter for giving me the details on this, because in the period, in a, a period that spanned about six months, when um, jury uh, nullification information was being handed out to people standing in line going into the courthouse for jury duty, over that six months, they found that at the beginning, it was like a week to get someone convicted, a day to pick the jury, four days for the trial, and before your home, before you left on Friday, they were convicted. But then it got harder as more people learned about jury nullification. It was taking more than a day to be able to pick a jury because they were trying to weed out more and more fully informed jurors. And then the trial would, they'd have to come back on Monday to wrap it up. And then they started not getting convictions. And by the very end, they basically had the, the, the prosecutor give up trying to convict people of uh, medical marijuana users of these cannabis crimes because it was becoming too humiliating for her to be losing all the time. And at the same time, sadly, now disgraced, <laughs> but uh, at the time, uh, the person who was the mayor, I believe he was the mayor of San Diego, actually was talking openly about jury nullification in the media. Sadly, there was a little uh, some sort of uh, sexual harassment uh, situation. And so he didn't make a very good poster boy after that, but I will mention it. I will mention that it was not only during this time, those accused of cannabis related offenses who benefited. There was also a man named Jeff Olson who was being prosecuted for Vandalism. Oh my gosh, that's terrible, right? No one likes vandals. They are property criminals. They're damaging other people's property. Well, why would I be telling you about a story of jury nullification involving vandalism? Does Fiji like vandalism? No. However, I mentioned that in that way because when I got quoted by a, I'm going to use the scare quotes here, journalist in a newspaper about this trial. I feel like I got sucker punched because uh, he basically made it sound like I was endorsing vandalism. The quote unquote vandalism in this case was that uh, Jeff Olson was outside a Bank of America branch, I believe it was Bank of America, sidewalk chalking uh, messages that he felt Bank of America was behaving inappropriately and was spreading that message via chalk on the sidewalk. Now, I don't know about you, but as a kid, I did that plenty of times. The only difference was that I was drawing a hopscotch grid or as we like to do at my house, uh, I was drawing a street on our driveway so that we could play a game we called driver's ed where you sat in a little red wagon and had one of your siblings push you around. It was your job to steer with the handle so that uh, you, you could show that you passed your driver's test. Well, we never got arrested for that. We never got arrested for drawing on the sidewalk that wasn't on our property for, for our hopscotch grids. But I guess we aren't Bank of America either. <laughs> so 
What I understand from the news reports is that apparently Bank of America didn't appreciate this and reportedly uh, may have put in a complaint to the city who then had this person arrested. He was charged with 13 counts of so-called vandalism, putting him at risk for a maximum penalty of $1,000 per charge and a year in jail per charge. 13 years in jail and $13,000 fine for chalk on the sidewalk. This is in a town, by the way, that hosts at least one public sidewalk chalk art festival, possibly more. And also, let's think about what else is on the sidewalk if we want to do so for one distasteful moment. Uh, in a city, there is constantly litter. Uh, people are relieving themselves on the sidewalk. There are tire marks. There, there is, you know, all sorts of filth and detritus and, you know, bird droppings. I, I can, I cannot even begin to name everything that you find on a sidewalk, but the chalk is the problem. It's vandalizing. <laughs> That's certainly an interesting take. Now, I think most of us probably don't approve of vandalism. I certainly don't. I don't want my property damaged. But when you're talking about marking on a public sidewalk that is already, you know, filthy with all sorts of other things, and this substance is going to wash off naturally the next time it rains, is that really what we're worried about with vandalism? Is that really something we want to throw someone in jail for 13 years for, have them become uh, wards of the state essentially, be, have, have to be housed and clothed at taxpayer expense, and then when they get out, how are they going to support themselves? What kind of trauma have they been through inside of prison? Uh, prisons are not nice places. There are physical assaults. There are sexual assaults. There's all kinds of abuse, not only from sometimes from um, prisoners, but also very, very alarmingly from prison officials. And there's virtually no accountability for them. And we're going to do that to someone over drawing something on the sidewalk in chalk. In an extra ironic twist, while he was in court, there were supporters outside with chalk. And the police drew a box on the sidewalk and told these supporters, if you want to draw messages of support of this person, they have to be inside this box. If you draw a message outside of the box, you will be arrested for vandalism as well. It is so nonsensical. It is so random. It's clear that this is just the state trying to exercise control. And I thank those jurors so much in that case for finding him not guilty on all counts. He, in fact, turned, out, turned down multiple uh, offers of plea bargains in order to get there. So for those jurors to really uh, stand up for him and come in on his side, it just means so much. Right now, we have a legal system in the United States where trial by jury is virtually extinct. Um, and I'm going to, uh, actually, I'll probably, if you're on Facebook, you probably saw it this morning. Uh, if you're not, I'll be sending an email probably tomorrow with this. But uh, the situation is described a little bit in an op-ed written by Ed Tynan. Yes, relation. He's my dad. After completing our op-ed writing workshop a couple of weeks ago. Uh, he submitted this and it was published yesterday, but it talks about how plea bargains have essentially overtaken uh, trial by jury extensively. And that was bad before the pandemic, but now with the pandemic where we're seeing not only previously, but now once again, when, we're, when uh, the government is talking about um, case numbers surging, we're seeing courts just suspend the right to trial by jury with no um, speedy trial enforcement whatsoever. Um, and so people just can't get speedy trials, but instead they're held in these unhygienic, unsanitary facilities called jails and prisons. Um, uh, I should say just jails, I guess, because I'm talking about people pre-trial. People who haven't been convicted and can't get their jury trial, they're now being given the the choice. You can have a plea bargain and get out, 
even if you're, you know, innocent, you can take, you can lie and get that deal. But if you want your jury trial, we have no idea when we're going to give it to you. And you're going to be stuck in this incarceration facility with overcrowding, with improper um, med- or subpar medical care, with um, unhygienic, unsanitary conditions, oh, in the midst of a deadly pandemic, when you could be at risk of dying without ever having even been convicted. So that is something to consider um, when you are a juror. If you are um, sitting there, I know you're very inconvenienced. You're getting paid probably a pittance. You're lucky if you break even on expenses for the day because you're probably going to have to pay for your lunch and parking and transportation or whatever. But then when you look across the room and see that person sitting at the defendant's table, you know, they had to they had to have some serious fortitude to get there themselves too, um, especially now when not taking a plea bargain has so many more potential risks and consequences. Um, now to just circle back a little bit to these cannabis cases, uh, I definitely want to be sure and mention two wonderful um, wins in Georgia in recent years. Um, and I'm gonna mention these because there is a wonderful attorney, Catherine Bernard, who's also a Fiji state contact for Georgia, who has just been wonderful in pursuing jury nullification in the courtroom. Georgia has a, a, a it was one of a few states with a feature that is sometimes helpful. Georgia actually has codified in their state constitution that jurors judge the facts as well as the law in the case. So not just facts as judges will tell them, but also the law. Now, there are a few other states that either directly state this or sort of indirectly state it, such as uh, the wording might be jurors can judge the law as well as the facts in cases of liable as in other cases, it's a little nebulous, but a lot of those states have that libel provision because of the John Peter Zinger case. They they wanted extra protection for that kind of um, situation. They aren't saying, oh, only it's not, you're only allowed to nullify in those cases. It's that they wanted to be extra clear in those cases that yes, those are among the cases you can nullify. But Georgia has a wonderful statement that's just kind of a blanket statement that I think is very clear. And it's one of a handful of states to do that. I think there may be four. The problem is that even in states where this is explicitly stated, judges outright lie about it. They will lie directly to jurors. They will lie in appeals cases. We saw that in Maryland. But Catherine is very dogged in making sure that in these cases where it's, it's a, a, it should be a consideration that jurors get to hear it. And she is such an expert at bringing this information in front of jurors without, she's, she's walking a very fine line. Let's, let's be sure about that. Um, Without getting uh, too far on a judge's bad side Uh, But at the same time, making sure that that information gets out. And in two cases, she has actually had her client take the stand, admit to the offense that they are accused of uh, involving either possession or a transaction for, for cannabis, and then tell the jury why they did it. And if you look up um, Antonio Willis or Giovanni Mondre McCoy, you will find a number of news stories on those particular cases that talk about that. So it's very important to me that we have more attorneys like Catherine who are willing to go a little bit out on the ledge there. Uh, I was in a, 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 a clubhouse event a few days ago where I had a number of people saying, well, why can't we need to get the lawyers to talk about this? Well, lawyers for the most part, are not going to talk about jury nullification. They have spent a lot of money to go to law school. They're probably largely uh, uh, have a large debt over law school. Then, And this is the one thing they're trained to do, the way they earn their living, the way they feed themselves, clothe themselves, house themselves, and their family. 
And it all depends on the state agreeing with them that they are allowed to practice. If this was your one source of income, the one way you could take care of yourself, you might be very careful with how you used it. And I totally understand that. (laughs) So what I have told these folks is that that's kind of why lawyers are not Fiji's target audience. We go straight to the public who are going to one day sit in those jury seats. Um, the other, the other thing that I, I heard repeatedly in that, um, that in that clubhouse event was, we just need to make a law. Why can't we make a law? <laughs> This, this was an event that involved people who have loved ones currently in prison for cannabis and even someone who spent decades of their life in prison for cannabis. Why can't we make the government do the right thing? And I'm going to explain that right now. The government, it does not now, it never has, and will never have an incentive to tell you that you do not have to comply with its dictates. It is never going to have an incentive to tell jurors that they don't have to enforce the law. I think the sooner that we recognize and um, embrace that fact, instead of trying to fight against it, the sooner we're going to do a lot better in our efforts because we're going to understand that diverting attention from educating the people who really can do something, and that is the jurors, When we're diverting attention from that, we're basically just spinning our wheels. So I'm really thankful for an attorney like Catherine, because she is one of the few who will actually go in the courtroom and argue this sort of thing. I don't hold out a lot of hope for other attorneys to do the same. And uh, even in a state like New Hampshire that once passed a so-called jury nullification law, that law has proven pretty much ineffectual. I explained this in the clubhouse event. And even after I explained it, the person who said, oh, uh, you can talk about jury nullification in the courtroom in New Hampshire. Even after I explained that that is not the case, that person still uh, hung on to that statement and remade it. And I, I didn't know what to make of that. But here's the situation in New Hampshire. Uh, Several years ago, the New Hampshire legislature actually passed what was then considered to be a jury nullification statute. It did not instruct the judge to tell the jury anything in particular. What it did was it allowed the defense to argue to the jury that uh, they should nullify in a particular case. And this was used successfully in one case, as far as I know. And the very next case where it came up, things went terribly wrong. As allowed by the law, the judge did let the defense in their closing statement argue to the jury that they should nullify some drug charges. The prosecution then gets the last word as far as closing statements and acknowledge to the jury that they could if they wanted to nullify, but made the case to them that they should not. They should instead uphold the law, convict the person, and he'd be punished. After all of that, the judge essentially instructed the jurors that what they had just heard about jury nullification was all wrong and they weren't allowed to do it. Unsurprisingly, they went off and convicted this person. Well, the judge outright lied to the jury. And so the case was appealed. New Hampshire does not have an appeals level court between the trial court and the Supreme Court. Their only court of appeal is the the state Supreme Court, I believe, And on a nine to zero ruling, that state Supreme Court agreed with the the person making the argument for the state, um, who in oral arguments said, oh, justices, you know what? We all thought this was a jury nullification law, but that's wrong. I reread it and it turns out it's not a jury nullification law. This is just a law that restates the situation where uh, the, uh, the defense could make certain arguments beforehand, but it's not about actually about jury nullification. And they, that person basically gave the flimsiest little hook that the uh, new state Supreme Court could hang its hat on and agree with them. And all nine of those judges said, you're right. What everyone thought was a jury nullification law actually isn't. And that person's conviction stood. And since then, I have not heard of another single case where this has been, even though it's on the books, where it's been uh, used successfully to help anyone. So 
while it was tried, it failed. <laughs> and that's why I keep coming back to jurors and why it's so important we educate them and why it's so important that when you are called for jury duty, you keep in mind your, your power, your authority, and your right of jury nullification because you're going to be lied to about it once you get inside the courthouse. You're going to have, have things brought up that uh, maybe mislead you or imply things that they're not allowed to imply. One of the common things I've seen in recent years is that um, previously instructions to the jury were worded specifically in a certain way. Um, and that was that if you believe beyond reasonable doubt that the person has uh, broken the law, you should convict. If you do not believe beyond a reasonable doubt that the person has broken the law, you must acquit. And that should must dichotomy there was what courts have said since uh, Sparf and Hansen in 1895, the one United States Supreme Court case discussing jury nullification. That is the, the verbiage they have said clues the jury in to their right of jury nullification such that they don't have to be instructed about it explicitly. What is and has been through the entirety of the US, US legal history absolutely prohibited is that, uh, and this traces right back to the William Penn case that we talked about at the beginning, is that judges cannot require jurors to vote guilty. They simply are not allowed to. And yet you now see jury instructions where jurors are told explicitly or very strongly implied, it's very strongly implied to them that you will convict, you must convict, and, uh, things like that. Um, I've only seen this overturn in one case and that was by the Kansas State Supreme Court and sadly, it wasn't because of that instruction only. The Kansas State Supreme Court said, well, if that was the only thing that went wrong in this trial, we would have let it slide. It would be considered harmless error. But they also found three other defects in that trial, each of which standing on their own, the court considered harmless error. But the court said, when we group these all together into this collection of four errors, they are in aggregate no longer harmless. And that was the reason that got overturned. Uh, so I have to tell you, <laughs> that does not make me happy. I have no trust in the courts to do the right thing. I have no trust in legislatures to do the right thing. I believe in jurors. Jurors are my heroes. Now, I'm not saying that everyone who sits in a jury box is a hero. I know the stereotype. I know what you're all thinking. Oh, you, who, you're on the jury. Those are the people who are too dumb to get out of jury duty. Well, let's end that stereotype. Let's, let's all consider not going there anymore. What I am saying is that we need heroes in our jury boxes. And how are we going to get them? If we continue to denigrate uh, people simply because we didn't understand their reasoning or we disagreed with it or whatever, uh, and make it so that it is an embarrassment to have served on a jury, who is gonna be on a jury? Are they the heroes? Are they the people who would be able to stand up for the, the accused? Or are those people gonna be like, you know what? I just don't even wanna have anything to do with it. Um, I, I just, I don't wanna be a part of that. We need those conscientious people. We need you as a conscientious person to take jury duty, to get on the jury, to serve conscientiously and to deliver just verdicts. And so I want to just in closing, remind you once again of the exhortation that William Penn gave to his jurors as he was being dragged from their presence. You are Englishmen. <laughs> Mind your privilege, give not away your right. So I'm asking you to please keep that in mind. And when you are called for jury duty, keep not a, give not away your right and mind the privilege that you have to be a hero to someone else. And with that, I'm gonna wrap it up for today. Happy Jury Rights Day, everyone.